So our keynote will be given by Chris Graf. Uh, Chris is a well-known and recognized voice in research and publication ethics. Uh, Chris is a past chair of COPE and has been in key research and publication ethics positions at Wiley and now with Springer Nature. Um, he is currently chair of the governance board for the STM Integrity Hub and on the program committee for the World Conference on Research Integrity. Uh, I consider Chris my role model for research integrity and a close colleague. So it is with great pleasure that I turn this over to Chris. Chris, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, what a nice introduction. Um, touched. Um, hi, everybody. It's really great to be here with you. So yeah, um, I'm Chris Graff. Like Dan said, I lead a, a fabulous research integrity team at Springer Nature in two parts, actually. So there are two parts to our research integrity team, one dedicated to the prevention of research integrity problems led by the fabulous Tamara Wellshot, one dedicated to the resolution of integrity problems led by the equally fabulous Tim Kirsches. And um, also, I mean, I, I have to mention the other parts of my team. I, I lead our work on editorial and publishing policy recently under Imogen Rose, and the also fabulous uh, work on indexing, which my great colleague Sonal Shukla leads. So you can see I've got a, a broad portfolio, and I, I bet if you had to think about that, you'd appreciate how those three areas, integrity, um, in, indexing, and policy connect and create a whole. And I think it's um, a really great team to lead within a really great organization. Today, I wanted to, to take you on a bit of a journey. Um, it's the first time I've done a keynote type presentation. And I, I recognize that you'll be learning a lot today and perhaps hearing a lot of stories that are challenging to you. So I wanted to try and um, lift the mood a bit and um, bring you some, you know, get you, get you thinking in different ways and bring you some um, ideas that might leave you inspired and um, ready to climb your own mountains. Um, one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this was, I mean, I, I remind myself of this story often. About a decade ago, I visited the Plant Sciences Building at the University of Bristol in the UK to did have some training on publication ethics to postgrad students. And as was my sort of go-to style at the time, I started with a whole load of headline-grabbing stories. And the kind of stories that get headlines are usually the, the sort of the stories about problems in research integrity. And so I hit them up with all these, all these headlines. And um, almost immediately, they're, 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 they went from smiling faces to sort of, what's the right emoji? That one with a straight line mouth. Um, and then by 10 minutes in, they're all you know, downturned smiles, the opposite of a smile. And I figured that that would be the last time I'd do that kind of presentation. So, um, and I've pretty much stuck to that. So, so I'm trying to leave you here with some things that that make you feel inspired and and make you recognise the contribution that we all make as people committed to publishing ethics and research integrity. The make you us all realise that it is an important contribution, and and that we've all got each other's backs there. So while I begin, um, I'd like you to think about what your mountain might be. Personal mountain, perhaps, challenge you're dealing with in your home life or perhaps in your professional life. And that's um, maybe you're climbing a professional mountain. Um, and while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you a story about a personal mountain that um, I recently climbed, actually a real mountain. And um the the uh, I, get, I guess you'll get the metaphor along the way. It's pretty bloody obvious. So a couple of years ago, in fact, right at the start of the pandemic, two of my friends and I were planning a a, a, a climbing trip. We had a real mountain to climb. And it's called the Catinaccio d'Ante Moya, and it's the highest mountain in the group of mountains in the Dolomites in Italy, uh, called the Rosengarten Group. And it's in that kind of little area where Italy meets Austria and Switzerland, pretty close to Venice, actually, about an hour. So we had 
some plans, we had like great ideas. We had a map, a lot better than the map that's on the screen. And we had a team, right? Me and Steve and Tom, and, and we set out to do the climbing. One of our milestones along the way was this place on the left. Uh, it's called the Refugio Violet. I think that means violet. Um, and it's right nestled right underneath the Catenaccio range. You can see those mountains towering above the sort of guest house there. And we'd walked in to this point, right, a few days in, and, and, and we stayed at this guest house to kind of recuperate a bit, build up our energy. Um, we we ate some really good food, some noodle, if you've ever been to the Tyrol. Uh, there's kind of like British dumplings and really uh, fortifying. We slept in this guest house in a room with, I don't know, eight or ten other trekkers on these tiny little bunk beds. Um, everyone was snoring, um, but it was good. And we made some new friends like this dog on the right hand side that I kind of made great friends with and fell in love with each other, I think, a little bit. Um, while we were there, we got our tools together. Uh, we were climbing these mountains using these things called via ferrata. They're kind of steel ladders bolted to the sides of the mountains wherever it gets a little bit precipitous. Um, and make actually climbing very safe. Um, we used kind of special belts with carabiners and um, helmets and so on. So while we were at the refugio, we got got all that kit together and we sort of set out. But of course, there were there were darker moments along the way. The picture on the left shows a kind of a storm that arrived within uh, half an hour, and suddenly the the clouds came down. It got dark and lightning um, started. To flash in the distance and naturally we were terrified about getting struck by lightning which we didn't happen um but of course even in those darker moments the sort of promise of the summit was ahead of us um uh, waiting for us really and we were continued to be determined uh, to to reach it and we did we got to the top of the catenaccio d'antemoya and we celebrated with a sort of a battered banana at the top um 3002 meters uh, and that was the best banana I've ever eaten, I tell you. Um, and of course, then we set out on our way back down. And pretty much as soon as we got to the bottom, we wondered what the next challenge would be, which direction we'd be heading in, which mountain would be our next mountain to climb. And that's my mountain climbing story with some pretty pictures for you. Uh, you know, it is a metaphor, of course. And I did ask you to think about what your uh, mountain might be. And perhaps you've got ideas. Um, perhaps you know, let's think big here. Maybe your mountain is uh, along the way of the sustainable development goals. Perhaps it's climate change. I think you'll probably agree that we're quite lucky in research publishing. What we do every day advances discovery and helps to solve the world's biggest challenges, albeit little bit by little bit, and all those little bits add up. If you're even more lucky, you work for a company like I do that's pretty focused on the sustainable development goals. And maybe that for you makes those links even more clear and explicit. But even if you don't work for a company that really thinks about things like that, those links really are there in research publishing, irrespective. And um, the SDGs certainly are a mountain to climb. Maybe that's your mountain. Or perhaps you're, you know, Mountain is managing the an ever increasing number of submissions to your journal or journals. You know that the ever serving the ever increasing demand that researchers place on research publishing. Uh, the chart on the slide, I don't show the absolute numbers, but it does show growth normalized around the mean in records logged by dimensions for publications in the last 10 years. And actually the real numbers are growth per that database from about 3.8 million publications in 2012 to about 7 million in 2022. And that kind of growth certainly is keeping everybody busy and maybe that's your mountain. Maybe you're just at the end of the fire hose trying to keep, keep on top of it all. Certainly keeping us all quite busy. Or perhaps because, you know, this is publication integrity week and a day dedicated to misconduct and fraud, maybe you're thinking about retractions. Perhaps it's a mountain of retractions and perhaps you're heading somewhere towards whatever this peak retraction might be. 
this is the same chart from the previous slide with the growth in retractions kind of overlaid and um, normalized again around the mean to make them uh, sort of comparable. And you can see that the, the change in the number of retractions that have been published. And I think we're kind of in the foothills of whatever peak retraction might be right now. Maybe the peak is somewhere ahead of us. I think it's quite a way ahead of us. But um, maybe that's your mountain. I'm not sure. Have a think about it. Um, to partner this slide, it is responsible to not only talk about the growth rate in retractions, but to show you something about the overall numbers. Um, so the areas of the circles, well, <laughs> one of the circles is on this slide. The other one kind of isn't. It's partly on this slide. But the areas of the circles represent the total numbers of retractions from the year 2022. And you can see um, the, di the dimensions registered uh, publications in 2022 20 was about 7 million. And the total number of records in Retraction Watch database, now, of course, added to Crossref um, in 2022 was 6,000. And the dots help you get a scale for what that really means. Um, and maybe one in a thousand uh, uh, papers are retracted at the moment. So maybe you found yours, your mountain. And maybe um, because this is, after all, a publication integrity week and this is misconduct and fraud day, maybe it's retractions. Um, perhaps hmm, maybe that's what we should focus on uh, for the next few slides. Perhaps you're dealing with right now something a bit like this. It's a fake article. A fake article created by a shadowy organization called uh, a paper mill i'm sure you know that um, and the paper mill then sold authorship positions to scientists and, and it didn't just stop there the paper mill then placed perhaps placed fake guest editors into your journals in positions of power and influence there where those fake guest editors perhaps they accepted hundreds or thousands of fake articles in one or more of your journals um, and perhaps nobody noticed for a while, but then perhaps when somebody did, perhaps all hell blowed loose. And uh, maybe that's maybe that's what you're dealing with. And maybe that's your mountain. It's certainly a mountain that many of us are climbing at the moment. Um, of course, the fraudsters, they've been using AI. They've been using a large language model to create those fake articles. And often the articles are sort of nonsense um, with invalid text conjoining uh, concepts like rainfall in coastal areas with the library book push system whatever that might be and then the internet of things and perhaps that was actually when you looked at it quite obvious and really embarrassing and equally reputationally damaging for your journal or journals or indeed your publisher um but of course using ai Old school AI, AI is getting a lot better, isn't it? So perhaps we can expect more of that and for the signs of paper mills to be harder to spot. And perhaps the challenge is, is growing. Well, it's okay. You're not alone. Um, we recognize that a shared challenge like this, and it is a shared challenge for us all, needs a shared solu solution. Um, we've got your team. We've got your tools. We've got your allies and friends that you might meet along the way and your support network. We've got opportunities for you to share what you've learned and the experiences you're going through and to use those to help resolve or prevent problems in the future and to support each other and to celebrate when you get something right and get a win. Um, the next couple of slides, I'll remind you of things coming from COPE and from the SDM Association, uh, which emphasize that this shared challenge of paper mills, but beyond the challenges of paper mills into the rest of the research integrity space are challenges that we can all and are all working on together. The first of those things is the United to Act Summit, 
from earlier this year, led by COPE and also with the STM Association. Um, the, the sort of the goal of the United to Act Summit was to combat paper mills and research fraud in general by taking a broad stakeholder engagement uh, approach. And the, you know, I was bowled away. I attended, maybe some of you did. I was completely bowled over by the the uh, diversity and breadth of representation in, at the summit. Um, it really did involve um, all sorts of different bodies involved in research, both across disciplines and but also around the world in different nations. And it was the first time ever a group of stakeholders like that had been brought together to discuss the problems that we're facing and to work on solutions. If you were there, you'll know that the stakeholders shared great insight and uh, across the, I don't really even remember, 20 or 30 short presentations that were given across the summit and a great commitment to finding solutions and a willingness to work together to solve the problem of paper mills. And it hasn't just stopped there. It wasn't just about getting people together in the room. It was about creating an action plan, which um, I'm excited about, uh, an actionable multi-stakeholder action plan to address the paper mill problem, which will result in a consensus statement draft, which will come around to the participants in the next couple of weeks, I'm told. Brilliant, right? Um, and then will be shared more widely. So thank you to the United to Act team at COPE and STM, and particularly Deborah Khan for leading the charge, and also to all of the contributors to that wonderful piece of work. It really is making a difference. And it doesn't stop there, there is more. I mentioned the STM Association. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with, you probably are familiar with the STM Association. It's the global trade body really for um, academic and research publishers. And its motto is advancing trusted research on this slide here. And of course, research integrity is a critical and core part of that alongside sustainability and, uh, and open research. And STM realized a couple of years ago that um, the sector needed to focus on research integrity and solutions to research integrity problems, namely paper mills, and brought together a collaboration called the STM Integrity Hub Now, designed to equip us all in our community, the scholarly communication community, which includes, of course, more than just publishers, with the intelligence technology um, and so on that we need to protect research integrity. And it's absolutely incredible, I think. Um, now there are, I've never seen anything quite a collaboration quite like this now now there are 35 uh, or thereabouts publishers and organizations actively contributing knowledge data intelligence and so on to to the to the mission of the integrity hub um 35 publishers with 70 people from those publishers and others uh contributing to the work so if you're one of those thank you um and also of course we recognize at the STM Integrity Hub that we can't do it alone. We've got to collaborate with other organizations like, like COPE um, and also with uh, people who we refer to. I wonder if they refer to themselves as sleuths, the integrity sleuths out there spotting problems and sharing information and insights as well. So it's a really broad collaboration. It's quite a wonderful thing. And it's important that we understand that it has to be a collaboration. No one of us, no matter how large our publishing house is, or our organization is, no one of us can solve this alone. We have to do it together. Um, partly because it's kind of whack-a-mole. If, 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 if I were to solve a problem at Springer Nature, then that problem would just go elsewhere. And when things happen at one publisher, they impact on us all per the reputation of our whole sector. So it's it's really critical that we develop some sort of shared immunity to um, paper mills and other research integrity problems because it's a non-competitive space we all we all benefit um 
it's also critical that we recognize that some organizations have more resources than others as well and we need the work that goes on at the hub to be accessible and able to be benefited from by organizations irrespective of their size so we've set this up from the start to be as inclusive as as it possibly could be and it's truly wonderful um some highlights include the regular meetings of the working groups and the task forces and if like i said if you're not already in one of those you can join you don't even need to be a member of the STM Association in order to do that. We're working with um, people from organisations who, at the time anyway, weren't um, STM Association members. Subsequently, some of them have become STM Association members, but that's not, not important. Um, we have agreements in place with more than 10 publishers. Actually, the agreements are critical. Those agreements enable data sharing to happen and pilots to be run including the minimum viable product pilot for the paper mill checking tool, which is ongoing right now. And if you want to get into that, your organization does have to sign an agreement. It doesn't cost you anything then to test the MVP for the paper mill checker, and you can do it. Um, and a soon to be launched duplicate submission checking tool to test whether we can prevent paper mills by looking for duplicate submissions across the different um, publishing houses. Of course, you might look for duplicate submissions already within your publishing house, but that isn't all of them, right? And um, there are signals that we can use, well, we can use duplicate submissions between publishing houses as a signal to, um, to, to address paper mills there too. So there you go. Together, it's really clear. I mean, the United to Act Summit and the STM Integrity Hub are clear examples to me that together we are doing the right thing doing the right thing who knew that retraction watch has a tag for all of the stories on retraction watch where someone has done the right thing maybe maybe you knew that um it's a uh, an attribution given to certain stories by the founders of retraction watch adam marcus and ivan Lorensky, that indicates admirable behavior by one of the parties involved that person is usually a researcher who took a hard path not like the researchers who used the services from a paper mill but took a hard path to do some research and then took an even harder path to climb a mountain and you know correct the record and being retraction watch retract an article so let's um change gear a bit and remember that we're here to serve the research community and celebrate some of the good things um, that happened in the research community by telling one of the do the right thing stories from Retraction Watch. We've got, before uh, doing that, let's have a look at another diagram to get an idea of scale. Um, the Retraction Watch database, now that isn't just the stories on Retraction Watch, that's all of the uh, post-publication changes that are recorded in Retraction Watch. It includes about 46,000 records and the all time count for do the right things on retraction watch is only 141. And I think we should do something about that. <laughs> I think we should perhaps work out how to enable and encourage more researchers to do the right thing. And perhaps that would help um, Ivan and Adam to turn up the volume a bit on the do the right thing stories, because I think they're worth celebrating. Um, so let's tell one of those stories. We could, we've got, you know, a few to choose from, right? 141. We could start with an early career researcher at the the start of their research journey. And if we were to do that, this story of Susanna Stoll from University College London would be a good one. It really would be a good one. And thanks, Ivan Oransky, for the hat, for the tip off about this story and the others that follow. Um, but we won't choose this one. What happened was she found some code that was wrong and, and and worked it out. But we won't choose this one. You can go and read it if you if you like. Or we could pick a story from the quite the other end of the uh, research career path. We could pick a story, a do the right thing story from a Nobel Prize winner, Frances Arnold. Um, she didn't retract the work associated with the Nobel Prize, but she did retract some of her other work. But let's not do that either. Let's go somewhere in the middle. Let's find a story from somebody in the middle of their research career and tell that instead. 
So this is Nicola Smith from New South Wales in uh, Australia. She realized that she'd made a mistake in one of her papers. No, that's not true, in two of her papers. Um, and, and at that moment um, was faced with a dilemma. She could either tell the world about the mistake or pretend it never happened. What do you think she did? Well, because, you know, this is a do the right thing story. Yeah, you know what she did. She did choose to tell the world. So then the rest of the story, all on Retraction Watch, goes as follows. Um, the first signs of the problem were when uh, Nicola's students had found trouble in reproducing the data in her lab related to their work into orphan G protein coupled receptors. Um, Nicola looked into this and she figured out why and said, hey, guys, you're not going to believe this. There's a big problem here. Um, if you're into the technical details, a cloning error had messed up the experiments and meant that actually they were doomed from the very beginning. At that point, she realized that um, if she came clean about the mistake, she at least one of the articles, possibly both, um, would most likely end up being retracted. And she'd have to live, and her team would have to live with that mark on their record. And her first thought at the time was what she could do to minimize the impact on her team and herself, but mostly on her team and her two students. And like most of us, we saw advice from our peer network, from our support network. And so she reached out to a colleague who said, kind of tongue in cheek, perhaps, that despite the fact that she, Nicola, really cared about this particular G protein coupled receptor, nobody else in the world <laughs> really gave a, uh, a monkeys about it. And um, at that point, uh, perhaps for a whole day, um, Nicola Smith was almost convinced <laughs> that keeping quiet was the best way to protect a team and that that was the best option. But she slept on it, woke up the next day and realized that that particular line of reasoning that she could just ignore the error and move on was, was yeah, not the right way to go. So what she did, she um, alerted her institutes with, with which she was affiliated about the error. And shortly after that told the journals because she decided that transparency was the best path. And they retracted both the articles. And of course, because she told the institutes that triggered an institutional investigation that um, her and her students and team survived. And um, the words in retraction, which says that Nicola Smith thought this was the hardest thing, the most painful thing she ever did, but that it was doing the right thing. She says, you just have to do the right thing. Um, and it's also um, recorded on Retraction Watch that she felt an enormous weight lifted off her shoulders when she made that decision. And so despite facing, the, facing it down, facing down the challenges, she made the right choice, corrected the record and told the world. And we should celebrate that. So thank you, Nicola Smith. Um, I think um, you're a research hero. And thank you, Retraction Watch, for collecting these Do the Right Thing stories totally brilliant. So we've been on a journey together. We've climbed some mountains from the Dolomites via the sustainable development goals and the unending growth in demand for publishing. We went via the concept of peak retraction and I wondered how far we are from peak retraction at the moment. We've visited the paper mills and then we found our allies and our teams um, at the United to Act Summit and the SCM Association Integrity Hub. And I hope that we ended on an uplifting note about Nicola Smith and doing the right thing courtesy of Retraction Watch. I think that's quite a mountain that we've just climbed together to wring this analogy out as far as I possibly can. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And thank you very much. And I'll be very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That that was a, a delightful um, conversation, a, a delightful presentation. Um, so, just thinking back about 
you know, your general theme, you know, climb your own mountain as well. But um, I, I like the fact that um, you noted that we are not alone. We don't have to climb them alone. Um, that many of us have faced similar challenges and um, uh, we could do it better when we work collaboratively. But there is a question from one of the anonymous attendees that goes to that, and they were wondering um, how you're vetting the people who want to join these efforts through STM. Um, how do you determine whether one of the bad actors is trying to become involved um, within the, the whole effort to gain some insight? Wow. Um, so, so it's a really good question, isn't it? And um, we're really uh, careful with the information that we share about the activities that go on under the STM Integrity Hub and naturally really careful about the people who and organizations that participate. We're quite inclusive, I have to say, but, um, but all of the organizations that are participating and all of the actually individual people sometimes, the sleuths who are participating, are organizations with a track record, with a commitment to doing the right thing, and who bring expertise. So, um, yeah, one of the other things that perhaps is relevant here is how secure is the technology that we're building. Um, of course, it would be awful if um, if it were hacked. And so we've got very robust um, technology provision in place with regular penetration tests to make sure that it is as secure as it needs to be. And I I, I um, think we're in a good place. So I, I'd like to... I hope that gives some reassurance to the person who asked the question. Uh, um, and and yeah, I think we're in a good place. But constant vigilance is my sort of watchword there. Um, we're always, always on the lookout for mm, problems and um, would address them if they were to occur. Thank you, Chris. Um, actually, in a, in a follow up, another anonymous attendee um, wanted to thank you for a great talk, first off. Um, but they were wondering if you had a little more details as to exactly how they can get involved with the Integrity Hub and other working groups, especially if they're not current STM members. Who do they reach out to, for instance? Yeah, great. So um, thank you for asking the question to you, if that was you. Um, I, I, it, there's, a, there's a page on the STM Association website where you can express your interest. And the good colleague who you'll hear from later, who leads the charge on from the STM side is Joris van Rossum. So I'm sure Joris would be delighted to hear from you um, if, if, if you were interested in getting involved and would be able to explain more about how to get involved. Um, I bet Joris will share his email address later on. Uh, uh, yeah, um, but if you, you know, but otherwise you can just get in touch with the STM Association via its website and that will get you connected with the people who you need to know. Excellent. Um, now I see we do have a couple of questions about essentially um, uh, doing the right thing. Um, right. Uh, Maria uh, Machado is asking uh, about uh, Nicola Smith and how her career is going now. Um, I don't yeah. know, but I think Jennifer might also, Jennifer Byrne might also have some additional insight. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Yeah, you might. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I read the story on Retraction Watch. I haven't actually spoken with Nicholas Smith, but through the story, which is a lot longer than, in fact, there's a lot more, oh, you know, trauma, actually, than I conveyed. Um, so do go and check it out. But along the story, uh, at the time of writing, um, Nicholas Smith w was continuing in her role and was happy with it. And it was all working. The two students who had been working under her, one of them, them has moved, I believe, to work at Stanford and is in a good place in his work. I think the other moved on, decided not to work in research anymore, but was very supportive of about Nicola's commitment to doing the right thing and about her leadership of the lab. So I, there have been, as far as the story goes, there were, and excluding the trauma along the way, there were no... Um, mid or longer term negative impacts that that any of the people involved have suffered so so yeah i think it's positive all around jenny you're on cam uh, maybe you're on it yes add. yes i just thought i'd mention that i know nicola actually she's a colleague of mine here in australia 
Right. She's doing very well. She's an associate professor at the University of New South Wales and leading a team. So I think that shows that uh, certainly doing the right thing is, um, you know, I don't think has hindered her career. And she's been very open and spoken about her experiences here in Australia as well. Brilliant. I'm so happy to hear that. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. So following up on that, you know, it was a very difficult um, decision for Nicola to go forward with it. And I understand that there's a that dilemma with a lot of other people. So one of the anonymous attendees is also asked, why does it have to be so difficult? You know, what can we do or how can we as a community make it just a little easier for those honest actors to freely act honestly and not feel this horrible tension? Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, that's such a great question, isn't it? It's not a new question. It's a question we, many of us have been struggling with, basically, I mean, I'm probably even before I got into this whole space, but at least for a decade. I remember when we um, revised uh, the COPE retraction guidelines a few years ago, we were very careful to remove the word misconduct from the from the reasons for retraction. Of course, misconduct is a reason for retraction, but if your retraction guidelines sort of emphasize the the misconduct angle, then your the the our rationale and reasoning at the time was you're not doing anything to remove the stigma associated f f with retractions and and you're not helping people to do the right thing. You're not making it easier for them. So I think that um I think that the question is an interesting one. I wonder whether the fear of retraction isn't really the real fear that most researchers face it's not actually the retraction that they fear it's the stuff that comes before the retraction so nicholas smith because she reported um that the experiment was flawed to her institution that triggered an institutional investigation that was asking whether there had been misconduct and that must be terrifying thing to not only to know is coming but then to have to go through it's got nothing to do with whether a retraction is published or not it's a different barrier it's a different thing and and it's one of those things that um our experience at publishers is it actually is probably quite remarkable um a university inst or institution might go through uh thinking about misconduct or um some sort of investigation or some a no small number of times a year i actually don't know but i mean it's, it's small compared with the number of papers that research integrity teams have to consider that may be associated with misconduct or another kind of problem. And I think that gives us a more sort of intense experience with respect to retracting or addressing fundamental flaws, honest or otherwise, with a paper. And I think that our experiences, because they're more intense, or sort of more compressed, we've had more of them in a per period of time than probably a university has, maybe there's some things that we can get together with the universities and share that will help them to appreciate the um, kinds of concerns that we're dealing with and that they also deal with and to figure out where the where the barriers that we should remove actually are so some people have proposed um and it's an interesting proposal creating a different publication type for author um, identified retractions and not calling them retractions the face value, I think, is a cool idea, right? I think it should be explored a bit. But I honestly, I don't know whether the calling it a retraction or calling it something different is a barrier that will make the difference and make life easier for people like Nicola Smith who are trying to do the right thing. I suspect that it's one of the pieces, and I don't know how important it is and how much attention we should give to that versus other things that might be bigger barriers in the way. Yeah, so that's not a very precise answer, is it? Um, but I think there are some thoughts there that might be valuable for you. They were. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, as you said, there's a lot of different strings. And what are the ones that are really causing the the greatest tension within yeah. an individual that's sort of impeding them from doing that right thing? Um, you're right. Maybe changing the name from retraction to withdrawal or something to try to separate that nomenclature is a small effort, an interesting one, but is that really the core 
issue, the core problem of what could occur. I mean, we've read stories of people being accused, being investigated, losing years of uh, time as their research has been sort of frozen. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. there. I, I agree. I, I think it's worth exploring. And maybe it's not so much about the impact um, on numbers that the, that author initiated retraction calling something different creates. Maybe it's what it signals. Maybe it's what it looks like. And um, anyway, there you go. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, may, maybe there's a possibility too, as as COPE begins to do more to sort of embrace universities and research institutions as members, it gives a greater opportunity maybe for the universities to talk to the publishers, to the journals. Like you said, we sort of see things maybe from different perspectives, different time constraints, different numerical yeah. uh, concerns. And I'm wondering if keeping that conversation going and opening it up is actually a way of maybe informing the universities and maybe then working together, finding better pathways, especially those that have come forth seemingly honestly mm -hmm. open as opposed to those that are really trying to hide. Yeah, fair, fair, fair comments, Dan, thank you. Um, so let's see, I see we have a comment here um, back to the uh, using a different type of retraction for the right thing could make the rest of the retractions more accusatory by exclusion, though. Yeah. Um, so again, even within that uh, naming structure. Um, we'll... I agree with that. I mean, that's a really insightful comment, isn't it? <laughs> so you hive off the honest retractions and then what does that mean? The, re the remainder are, I get it. And um, yeah. That's right. Do you, do you increase the stigma of the actual term retract if you have stuff like withdrawal? Yeah. Or, yeah, basically unintended consequences. You change one thing, something else happens that you hadn't thought about that has, you know, even creates even more problems than you imagined. So, yeah, very good. Yeah. And I, I see that um, Maria Zaim has sort of said the same thing. Um, trying to separate retraction types between you know, actual misconduct and honest error um, is a pretty difficult judgment to make, right? I mean, yeah. it's... To, to, you... to, to respond more like precisely to that, the, the proposal actually wasn't to make a judgment about what was honest and what wasn't. It was simply to say an author-initiated retraction is called one thing, and a publisher or editor-initiated retraction or third party initiated retraction is another thing there was there was no judgment about whether either were honest but but anyway same same problems same problems are present yeah no I, I, absolutely um and yeah then there's the subtlety of if it was you know brought to the attention of the journal start a process of investigation is it enough that an author agrees the retraction at the end, or, you know, it, there's so many different layers and levels. It's a more of a continuum yeah. between author being totally denying anything wrong versus a, an author totally admitting that either uh, a contaminant was in the system or something else that threw the results off and making them unreliable. Yeah. So we have a, a question from... Uh, Sergey Landau, who's who's asked, how can we prevent that retracted article from being submitted to another journal or some flavor of it? Well, I think I understand the question. So, of course, the retraction happens after publication. And when the retraction happens, the right way to do that is to leave the article in place, watermark it maybe change the title of the article so it says retracted at the start of it and publish a linked retraction note that says this article has been retracted and explains why. So um, the retracted article doesn't disappear, it remains on the record. And of course, when you, um, most publishers use similarity check from Crossref on submission and that identifies when an article is similar with another article. So it's entirely possible to identify using that simple tool 
um, the, the resubmission of an article because it you know looks at the published corpus, including the previously retracted article, compares that with the newly submitted article, and then you know flags that a decision needs to be made to somebody in the editorial workflow, maybe the editor or maybe an assistant or somebody like that. So I, I don't think that's um, actually I don't I don't think that's a major concern. I think there's a technology and human solution for that thing. And actually, the real problem is getting in, getting the retractions done in the first place. <laughs> so um, there's certainly enough of those to be going around and focusing on getting that right. It's totally critical, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, good question. Thank you for it. Yeah, a actually, just, to, you know, maybe we can spend a few minutes on sort of a bit of a spin on that. It, it's, as you said, there's once a paper's published, right, mm -hmm. it's out there and can be used to compare to other papers. So if it's retracted, we have the tools, uh, relatively straightforward tools to identify that. But really, I think it's it's that whack-a-mole problem that you were talking about. What happens with um, problematic papers that are discovered prior to publication from one publisher, or uh, you discover a, a duplicate submission or something along those lines. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's possibly, yeah, you're right. That's probably what the um, attendee was thinking about, that the papers that didn't get published, but they got rejected because of integrity problems or, yeah, other problems. I don't yeah. know how to deal with that. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because one of the important principles that COPE holds dear is every paper should be judged on its own merit. And that's that means each time it's submitted to a different journal, rejudging it on its own merit. And I suppose that that's not very efficient, but it feels kind of like a good principle to hold dear and to stick with. So I it's 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 possible that the um STM integrity hub, and I'll explain a bit about how it works so so that you know you, you all know. But it's possible there might be some solution in there. So what the hub is, um, is like a central sort of warehouse for a data, a set of data to flow. And so, for example, Springer Nature could send its submitted article with the right permissions from authors and um, could send submitted articles in a flow through the integrity hub. And the Integrity Hub guarantees that um, nobody else will be able to look at those papers or understand what's in them. But it, but it's also true that we would be able, but but Elsevier might send a flow through, and comparing the flows would enable us to identify um, duplicate submissions, for example, simultaneous duplicate submissions between publishers for the first time. It's theoretically possible that that data could then be retained about retraction uh, rejections for whatever reason and then that could in theory create the kind of reference point for the resubmission of a fundamentally flawed paper at another publisher and then and, and so on I, I say this with enormous caveats i'm not even certain that that is a fair idea um because it's rather complicated and, and big and it kind of compromises that principle of looking at every paper and judging on its own merits so there would be some interesting questions to answer about questions to answer about whether about how to judge that a paper was fundamentally flawed how to record that and then how to how long to retain and how to use that information but it, i guess it's theoretically possible that the hub could provide a solution there yeah yeah could you have to be cautious there because a paper could be submitted to Springer Nature, be determined to have some fundamental flaw in it. But if it's an honest error, right, the author could have gone away, redone the experiment, so um, cleaned up the experiment, determined that it's con the conclusions are similar, and then basically publish a similar paper, but with clean data. Um, so still, the responsibilities on the receiving journal to probably give it a fair hearing or take a look at it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and it's really important to say with all of these fantastic power that technology brings to us, 
it, I mean, from my point of view, it should never be technology making a decision. It should be technology helping a human to make a decision. And that human needs to have the authority and auto autonomy and time and skills to make the right decision and do the right thing. So, so perhaps we're looking for assists from technology like the hub, not for like, you know, computer says no moments. And um, I think that's important as well. Yeah. And I do see um, uh, Maria uh, Zam again uh, has noted that there is a NISO, a NISO working group working on uh, best practices guidelines for the sharing of retraction notices, expression. Yeah etc um and i believe one of the things with the retraction watch uh data being bought by crossref hopefully it'll help make that connection because there's i think some concerns uh, um out there that um retractions aren't as clearly connected to the underlying paper uh on some websites as it should be yeah thank that's a good point uh, dan and maria thank you for that too it I think that the metadata around retractions are particularly inconsistent. And um, I mean, maybe we should just bundle all the post-publication um, changes or corrections in there as well. So so the, the acquisition of the Crossref, by Crossref of the Retraction Watch database is a really, really good thing, I think. Um, and I was really happy to have been on the uh, webinar last week to announce the announce the acquisition and, and so on and it was quite clear that um crossref will be able to connect the retraction watch manual curation of post publication changes the data and metadata around that in with the rest of the publishing metadata and that that's going to be there's going to be so many different applications for that i think it's wonderful absolutely um an anonymous attendee had an interesting point, wondering about how preprint servers may play a role in research integrity, right? For many areas, right, that's the starting point of a manuscript's journey, say in physics, which is mostly my background uh, with the archive. Um, so do preprint servers play a role? I don't know. I mean, relieving pressure on the perhaps overheated research system enabling researchers to communicate early work draft form perhaps that relieves pressure perhaps that um and perhaps relieving pressure uh is a, actually is a great thing right for researchers if you can help make a researcher's life one little bit easier then you know that's a good thing perhaps it also creates uh, opportunities for people who cut corners though i mean i i, I don't i th th there's different degree perhaps very little in some preprint servers different degree of checking of what is um posted to a preprint server and perhaps that's a risk i mean i think it feels like a risk to me um yeah i i am um, um, but I'm all up for relieving pressure on the research system. So in my mind at the moment, the balance is weighed firmly in the direction of, of preprints, the relief that on pressure that that creates, but also on recognizing that those are not uh, peer reviewed and they haven't been through the kind of rigorous examination, not just by editors, uh, academic editors and peer reviewers, but by the publishing teams that look at the different aspects of a paper on its way through its journey, including via peer review and editorial assessment to publication. And I, and I, as long as the difference between a peer reviewed article and a preprint is clear, and that's a big deal, right? Because it's not always super clear. Um, I think I think they're a good thing for research integrity. But you know, I say that as soon as I say that, they'll be. <laughs> something will go wrong on a preprint server and I'll, I'll, I'll regret having said it but anyway there you go i i'm a preprint fan at the moment um i know we're uh at time um just a a couple other uh notes that i see in the q a susan garfinkel mentioned you know one of the things we could do is is put a little bit extra burden on authors who are resubmitting withdrawn or retracted articles by indicating that they were retracted, withdrawn, the reasons for it, and what they've done to clean up 
So I, I think this goes back to understanding um, that in some cases, a retracted article, when corrected, can be resubmitted as a separate article. So in that sense, there's an opportunity um, to maybe have the authors clearly indicated so an editor can make an appropriate decision. Um, the other note I saw was from uh, Lee Harvey, who was just asking that he was a co-author of a journal that there was an error. Um, and, uh, you know, sometime later, they agreed, to, you know, the authors agreed it was statistical error. So they put in a correction and just wondering about sort of does corrections to the literature really have the same impact as actually retracting an article. So here the fundamental conclusions weren't changed, but there was a general statistical error. I, I also honestly think we could do a much better job with post-publication corrections, irrespective of whether they are a correction or, you know, a retraction or something like that. Um, I, I know that the authors are doing the right thing when they correct or take a different step, but, it, but I don't think the publishers are doing a great job on making readers aware of those publication changes. And, you know, I mentioned the inconsistent metadata around retractions and post-publication concerns. That's one of one of the things. I also recognize that we could do a lot better when we're um, when submissions, new submissions arrive with us to help the authors submitting that to understand that one of their 30 citations is a paper that has been corrected and check that they uh, check that they knew that and see whether it changes anything. Same with retracted papers. So so I um, I think there's lots of things that we could do. I think we're intently focused on publishing new work for new researchers, good good new work and helping progress to happen. And I think we're less focused than, than there should be on the post-publication world. And I think that that's critical for us to get a grip on, to demand from our um, leaders that we get investment in post-publication work and that world. And I think that's happening right in the integrity space for sure. Um, and I recognize that there's more coming up later in the day on post-publication changes uh, and also on um, the STM Integrity Hub and so on. So there's more room for exploring these in those sessions later. Uh, so yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we certainly have uh, more to talk about uh, in this area the rest of the day. So I, I hope uh, a lot of our attendees will be back throughout the day, if not stay with us the entire day. Um, but for now, we'll close this out. And Chris, again, thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.